Do you remember the turn of the 20th century, 1890s into, into 1900 and then all the way to 1913? Money and banking were on the front pages of newspapers. They were being discussed in union halls by blue-collar workers, right? Mm -hmm. This was not something that was arcane that the average person didn't know about, the average person didn't want to get involved in. We've lost all of that political involvement, and as a result, power has gravitated into the hands of a few people and left the middle class, uh, well, essentially at the mercy of this system. Yeah. We're but hostages to the system. Yeah, I'm sort of optimistic on this point, though, because you're absolutely right. The 20th century is marked by, I think, the general decline in terms of people's understanding of what money is, um, its importance to society. But the Internet, I think, is sort of changing that now. Uh, would you agree that oh, you yes. know, the information available on the Internet yeah, I is... Think the, I, I think the Internet is, has broken the logjam on that. Yeah. And then, of course, you have things like gold money that are coming out. I mean, that kind of technology has been proven. There it is. It works. Yeah. Right? It's at the cutting edge. Uh, we can solve problems very quickly with that kind of technology because it can be picked up essentially off the shelf right. and used by a state government. So as, as people realize that this is doable, it's not simply some pie-in-the-sky ivory tower type theorizing about why the Federal Reserve is not an effective instrument. We essentially, we know that. There are problems with that. But you eventually come back to the question, or very quickly come back to the question, well, what can we actually do to correct this? Mm -hmm. And now we have it. And the more people that realize that it's doable, the more likely it is that's going to be done. And the more likely they're going to understand, not only is it doable, but it's really essential to go back to a country which the framers originally envisioned and put into place for it, right. for us. Right. And that's, that's my ultimate goal. First things first, I mean, people tend to look at this problem in short-term economic approach. Well, what's in it for me? We say, well, what's in it for you is financial protection against this tidal wave that's coming in. Next step, state governments begin to reassert their authority. Next step, we actually make the federal system work and less power, or power is drained from Washington, and it comes back to the states and to the people. And it can be done first through currency, simply because we have the context now to do it there. In, in your assessment, you know, we're, we're moving pretty rapidly in terms of the problems with the dollar, the growth of the debt, you know, the federal deficits, we've got national uh, debt issues coming up, they're trying to increase, you know, two trillion dollars to carry it through to the November 2012 election, which in my view is just kicking the can down the road and showing that there's no political will to solve that problem. On the other hand, you've got states starting to address the issue and recognizing that there's a train wreck coming and, you know, maybe they should do something just in case that train wreck does really hit. Which is going to come first? Is the currency going to collapse uh, and we're going to have that train wreck or do you think that people will be able to prudently act at the state level and come up with solutions and maybe even head off that train wreck? Well, I think some states are going to come up with this solution sooner rather than later. I, mean, I think it's a hope because I can't be a prognostic. I'm not Nostradamus. Right? Before the train actually hits the end of the track. Uh, whether that will be enough, I don't know. Except that having that much created will enable others in the context of the crisis to attempt to shift over. I mean, you have to have the example. Somebody has to lead. And that's our difficulty. We're on the Titanic without lifeboats at the present time. Right? Mm -hmm. We've got a dysfunctional crew. We've hit the iceberg. Help is not coming, and we have no lifeboats. So we're in a worse position, I guess, than the folks on the Titanic were. Except for us, we can create those lifeboats now before this ship goes down. Mm -hmm. And if we have a few of them, well, that's better than nothing. But I have a feeling that, because, I mean, you know, James, you agree with me on this. I mean, the market is a tremendous force when we let it act to its full potential. And in this context, provide the alternative currency and the full force of the free market is going to be behind that. And then it will just sweep politics along with it. Yeah, that's how I've, I've always seen it. And, you know, I've always felt that the the answer to this problem, like answers to all problems, are going to come from the market. They're not going to come from government. Mm -hmm. And that the more alternatives that the market provides will help get us through what look like it's going to be a very difficult time, um, you know, mm -hmm. given what's happening to the dollar. Unless there's political will and political wisdom in Washington to get off of this path that they're on, that what I call the path to the fiat currency graveyard, mm -hmm. you know, do a 180 degree about turn and go back to constitutional sound money. And while there's a lot of um, uh, attention being given, to, for example, to you know people like Ron Paul and perhaps a few others, uh, they're still in the minority uh, and it, uh, unlikely to you know be able to turn that ship of state around and put it in the right direction. 
No, I think that's right. I think at the, at the national level in Washington, the likelihood is probably a negative number, uh, at least in terms of this train wreck uh, agenda that we're talking about. Yeah. But at the state level, uh, we have the opportunity. And uh, the reason I focus on the states is because I suppose theoretically what I'm talking about could be done by individuals. You could have competing currencies started by individuals or businesses. But the transaction costs are too high. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have enough political visibility. And there are certain things that might be done by rogue agents in the Treasury Department or even rogue agents in some state agencies to kind of suppress that activity. Whereas if you bring a state government in at this stage, then you tie the political and the market forces together, mm -hmm. as long as it's done on a sound basis, sound currency basis. Right. Um, you know, this video is going to be seen all over the, the world, all over the states. Is there any additional comments that you would like uh, to leave with people, you know, as you see things unfolding here, or what perhaps they can do uh, to protect themselves or to start a, a sound money movement in their particular state? Is there any guidance that you Well, like I think that's exactly the point. Starting a sound money movement in your particular state or for that matter, your particular country, country right, yeah. wherever, uh, there's a lot of information out on the internet about these alternative currency bills that have been put up. Uh, one of the things that I am promoting now is for people to go to their state representatives and say, set up an investigatory commission. There's a good bill that was written in Virginia on that, uh, so that we can bring some witnesses in front of an official body, get a record, get the evidence, get the testimony, educate some other state legislators, and propose some legislation that that investigatory commission would take back to the legislature and say, this is what we need enacted. Yeah. In other words, first air the problem and start addressing it, bring in different people, different points of view. And I guess it's really a recognition that there's a problem that exists, and secondly, that there's That's no right. solution at the moment, you know, if this problem does become worse. And I think proposing the solution to them is not simply, we have a problem, we have no solution. Here is a solution. Do you have anything better? And the answer will be, well, no, we don't. Therefore, right, therefore this will be picked up somewhere. At some stage, someone is going to pick up on this. And that's the beginning uh, of the end it seems, for our problem. It seems so simple. All somebody has to really do is pick up the Constitution and understand what the original intent of the framers yeah. was, understand what they went through with the Continental and the collapse of the Continental, why they tried to create a common market with a common currency. And then I would probably also recommend reading the Coinage Act of 1792. Um, which basically puts into practice you know, what the intent was of the framers in the Constitution. Right. It's, it's amazing how simple it is. Uh, of course, they were rather remarkable people and in, in put an assembly of, of that type together. Uh, but I don't think it's beyond our ability to look back and say, well, of course they did it this way. How else would you want to structure this kind of a system rationally? To limit government control, to maximize individual freedom, to take full advantage of the of the marketplace. This is exactly what you'd put in. Our advantage now is because they were using coinage. Right? They used a bimetallic system. Why? Because they didn't have the information available to be able to change the gold-silver ratio on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. But we, it gave Congress the power to regulate the value of, the power to, to change so that gold-silver ratio so you could so be on a silver standard or a gold standard. standard. We now have the technological ability to make that system work perfectly. Yeah. And that's the key advantage that we that, have. That we have now. And how foolish we would be if we didn't take advantage of that. But I will say that, you know, as brilliant as the framers were, the, con the Continental did collapse. Uh, you know, the political will just wasn't there to get off of this path to the hyperinflation okay. currency graveyard. The Continental collapsed, and only then did they have the, uh, the will to get together and create a, the Constitution and a, and a new system. But you know system. what's amazing about that? Who were the people that issued the Continental? The Continental Congress. Yeah, and, who, and the Continental Congress were made up of many of the same people who went to the Constitutional Convention, or they came from the various state legislatures that had had their own legal tender laws and their own paper money. And they took a look at what they themselves had done and said, no more. Yeah. This was a terrible mistake. Well, that's clear from the debates that's and, right. and uh, the notes, okay. uh, Madison's notes to the... And so there's one of the examples, of one of, I think, as far as I'm concerned, the only example I know of, where people who had made that kind of a political mistake did not try to save face and maintain the system and you know, improve the system, they turned around and said, this was wrong. We're going to correct this for all time by putting in constitutional limitations to prevent it in the future. And so it was for 180 years yeah. until we abandoned the wisdom in 1971. Mm -hmm. And we're now seeing with 30s, the, really. Well, 30s, 30s really, 30s, yeah, yeah, okay. That was the beginning of it. Yeah, that was the beginning of it. The last remnants right. of the gold standard or silver standard were ended in 1971. Right. And I guess the tragedy is, is that you know, here we are with the dollar 
not unlike where the Continental was near its final collapse. Um, and basically, we didn't learn from history. We didn't read the Constitution. We didn't understand the wisdom of the framers. And we're going to have to relearn once again you know, the, the things that they went through. Well, I refuse to accept that adage that no one ever learns anything from history except that no one ever learns anything from history. <laughs> Some of us have learned something <laughs> from history, and I think the circumstances are such that we can sell those ideas. Yes, and help least, educate. And, yeah, educate, and at least on a scale sufficient to begin a movement in the right direction. Yeah, well, you know, that's the whole purpose of the Gold Money Foundation. It's, you know, a, a not-for-profit organization that we founded basically to provide educational material. Uh, and with regard to the monetary situation in the United States, there's no better reference work than Pieces of Eight. Uh, Edwin, okay. it's been a real pleasure to chat with you. I really appreciate you taking the time out, and uh, best of luck to you in the future. Thank you, James. It's been my pleasure.